the, right. I agree. Right? I mean, they, look at they, the Japan, the, the Japanese yes, prime, the prime minister. Yes, the prime minister. A homemade gun yeah. was used to, to kill that guy. So you will, the technology is there. You will not stop it. Uh, criminals will get in. And, and that's, you know, that's kind of like the best case scenario. Yeah. I mean, let's face it. There are millions of guns. It's like removing piss from a pool water. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Literally, that's It's it just not going to happen. Welcome back to CF Podcast, guys. Kaya here. We've got the vice president, senior vice senior president vice. Yeah. of Gun Owners of America, Eric Pratt. Pleasure having you here, sir. It is great to be here. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Well, thanks for also having us here at the Gun Owners of America event, right? We yes. had a range day yesterday. Now we have the uh, exhibitors, manufacturers with the media team out there doing their thing. And that's... Uh, Pretty awesome thing. So thanks a lot for that. Now, a lot of folks know what Gun Owners America is. You guys are doing fantastic stuff, which we'll get to. But for those who don't, tell us about Gun Owners of America. Well, uh, we were founded in 1976, and we are the original no compromise group. We have been on the front lines uh, in Congress, uh, in the courts, and we bring a no compromise message. I'll give you an example of that. Yeah. Uh, around the year 2000, there was only one constitutional carry state in the country. That was Vermont. They've always had it. And uh, we were the first national group to start pushing for that, uh, for constitutional yeah. carry. Uh, we started getting uh, finding that legislators were getting pushback because there were a lot of folks in the pro-gun movement that wanted to keep the permit system. Why? Why? <sighs> Well, probably for a lot of wrong reasons. Mm. I can't think of any right reasons, yeah. to be honest. Um, and uh, we told those legislators, we've got you your back. We will support you. And that allowed, that gave them the freedom and the mm. courage to, to, keep, to keep going, to push for it. Well, it's so exciting. And now today we have 29 states uh, yeah. that are either constitutional carry, permitless carry. Uh, but, but that just is kind of a, a yeah. snapshot of... When we say we're no compromise, I mean, we're pushing for no infringements. That's what the Second Amendment mm -hmm. says. Shall not be infringed, and that's just been our motto all along. Yeah, so hopefully, come on, North Carolina. Is that next? Yeah. I'm mean, oh. trying, man. Oh, you elect Mark Robinson, uh, we'll get uh, constitutional care. All right, there. North Carolina, if you're watching this, Mark Robinson. Mark all Robinson. Right, we want that because it was... In fact, be he'll, there. he'll be speaking. Uh, he's one of the speakers at our uh, convention. So, this weekend, uh, yes. right? Very oh, exciting. Man. Look forward to seeing that because we, we got real close to it and then it got held back. I don't know what's going on with it right now, but that's why thanks to uh, organizations like Gun Owners of America because you guys really get out there and push. And when people say, when we say, especially when you guys say, no compromise, people immediately think this. Hey, you know what? It's okay. Like we should be able to compromise to get what we want. A little give and take. Why compromise is no good when it comes to Second Amendment? Well, besides the fact that it doesn't work because the other side wants to ban our firearms completely. Yeah. I mean, re remember with the DC Heller case? Yep. Uh, they were the other side was arguing for upholding DC's total ban on on handguns and you could have a long gun if it was you know torn apart hey, so that's where they want to go yeah. so first of all it, it it doesn't appease them that's mm -hmm. number one but number two the declaration of independence says that our rights come from god yeah. so it is not ours to give it is not theirs to take those are rights that come to us from the creator yeah. and so that's why when you see the second amendment say shall not be infringed i mean that just is hand in glove with yeah. what they stated in the Declaration of Independence. Rights from God cannot be give, given out or taken back uh, by our government. Yeah. And, and so that's how we look at this. That's yeah. why we have never compromised. We do not compromise. And by God's grace, we never will compromise. Yeah, and I love that. There's no compromise. People don't understand. Like when you start giving an inch, legitimately, they want a mile. Like some people say that, hey, you know what? So what from, the, I'm just hypothetically speaking here. Okay, 21 round magazine. So what if it's 15? You know, 15 is plenty, whatever, right? You give them 15, this is again hypothetical. 
then slowly it goes down to right. 13, then 10. And next right. thing you know, it's crazy. Like, you don't feel it. It starts happening slowly. And next thing you know, suddenly you got a neutered gun in California. You can't even operate under stress. Exactly. That's insane. So I love what you guys do. So with that being said, there's a lot of obviously things going on out there. We, we just went through the whole brace thing. I know you guys yeah. attacked that thing. And there's a lot of other litigations that's going on. You want to talk about some of the sure. cases? Uh, yeah. Probably the most exciting recent thing, because yeah. um, it just happened, and so a lot of people don't even know about yet, is our victory in New York. So we've got two cases. One is the Antonyuk case, where okay. we're fighting against their gun-free zones for concealed carriers, and we're fighting all the additional restrictions that they're imposing on concealed carriers. That case briefly went up to the Supreme Court, and they told the, the Court of Appeals, you're getting this wrong. Basically, they GVR'd the case. Mm -hmm. You're getting this wrong. you got to redo it. Okay, so that's that case. Seeing the handwriting on the wall mm -hmm. in our other case, which was we were representing Carl Higby of Newsmax. He lives out of state as a Newsmax anchor. He travels into New York City guy's a former SEAL. I mean, he's used to mm -hmm. carrying guns, right? He wants to carry a gun, but New York says we don't give permits to out-of-staters. So we sued on his behalf. And just this past week, hmm. New York City put up the white flag and they said, all right, we will start issuing permits to out-of-staters, which means now it will be possible to start in Florida and drive all the way up the East Coast with your concealed carry firearm, which up till now we have never been able to do because New York was always that choke point, right? Yeah, New York is horrible. It's terrible. Yeah. Well, now, now let me tell you, before we get too excited, it, it, this is New York City. They still have a slew of restrictions. That's and what I was going to get to. That you have to jump through in order to get the permit. But... It will be possible. They say they're waiving the non-resident requirement. So you will be able to get one. And then that permit is good throughout the state. So you will be able to stop off in New York, um, go to a restaurant. Yeah. You know, you're not going to have to travel like under faux pas where it's like, yeah. you know, honey, you know, uh, we're not stopping for the bathroom. Yeah. We're just driving, we're driving through the through. state, you know, yeah. putting the gun in the trunk. I mean, if you actually go through all that rigmarole uh, to be legal, but, yeah. you know, under federal law, that's how you would have to do it up to now. Now you can actually conceal all the way through, stop off, yeah, stop for the night, yeah. and you'll still be legal. That is crazy. That I'm glad this is happening. This is an amazing victory. And I know there are other restrictions. Like, I'm from Chicago, and it's a gun-free zone with a lot of gun crime. Wrap Go your mind figure. Around that. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, which I'd like to get to. But in New York, so you're carrying your gun, because I know there's some litigations out for that one too, right? That they say, okay, you know what? We allow you to carry in our city. Fine, Right but we're just going to go ahead and ban, like create restrictions for parks and schools. So and that's this, our that. Antonia case, the first yeah. one I mentioned, which is challenging all that. Yeah. And we won a lot at the district court. Uh, when they appealed it to the uh, Second Circuit, they took back a lot of the, the victories that we had gotten on gun-free zones. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we appealed it up to the Supreme Court. And what's interesting about this is, um, you know, and if you talk to lawyers, they love throwing around that word uh, inter, uh, interlocutory, right? Uh, What's that? Interlocutory yeah. is an appeal where you are still in the middle of the appeals process. And the Supreme Court never, almost never takes such an appeal if you have not finished your entire appeal you know, going through the whole appellate process. process. Yeah. Well, in the middle of the process, we just went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court took accepted it up. Accepted it. They accept now, this is where they GVR'd it. In other words, they, they granted hmm. our petition. Um, they vacated the lower decision. And so they remanded it back to them saying, you've got to get this right. You're getting it wrong. That's crazy. Like, that's... that's that's a needle in the haystack yeah. kind of probability for them to do that. But they, that, that, and so that's why seeing the writing on the wall, New York city's in their case said, oops, we, we, we better put up the white flag because we see where this is yeah. going. So, okay. I got a question about that. So the Supreme court sent back is like, Hey, listen, uh, there's some wrong here. You guys made some bad calls. We're right. going to give you the opportunity to re-review it and yep. fix it. Could those people, the lower courts just sit on it? 
Um, for a while, for years to come. You're theoretically possible, although they've already issued a briefing schedule. So okay. we were actually concerned about that. And so we were thinking about, okay, let's uh, start anew at the district court. Uh, but then as, while we were hashing that out, I'm kind of getting into inside baseball now. Uh, the appellate court uh, issued the briefing schedule. So the wheels are turning already. All right. So for those folks who just don't want all the technicalities, number one, you can now actually carry into New York Granted, the whole restrictions. Once you get your permit, permit. yeah, yes, and <laughs> through all the restrictions, right? Yeah, and now we got the other case, which is being re-reviewed. Yes, for hopefully some of those restrictions to be eased up. Absolutely, a bit. hopefully, yes. Freaking amazing! I love it. Thanks for that, guys. So, what are some other litigations? Because I know you guys got a lot of stuff going yeah. on, and I'm not going to go through all of them. But what are some of the other big ones that people want to know? Well, we've been taking on the ATF in all kinds of ways. Earlier, you mentioned the pistol brace ban. Yeah. So for GOA members, and let me just say this, we go in fighting for all gun owners, but district courts are hesitant to issue nationwide injunctions. So, when, so for example, when we challenged ATF's pistol brace ban, mm -hmm. uh, the court gave, uh, found in our favor, gave, you know, they... Uh, passed an injunction against the ATF, but they limited it to members. To members, mm -hmm. okay? That we didn't go in arguing for only members, but that's what we got. So anyway, I, we tell people, hey, this is part of the uh, benefits of membership, right? Exactly. We, we are fighting for <laughs> yeah. you. Um, so th there's that victory. Uh, we uh, just won a, another recent victory against one of Biden's ATF rules where, you know, if we were, let's say we lived in the same state and I wanted to buy a firearm personally from you, mm -hmm. now uh, Biden's rule, the ATF rule, would make us go through the background check system, have all that registered, which up till now has always been a freedom issue. I mean, we've had the freedom to mm -hmm. do that where government can't track that. Well, the Biden administration wants to track that. The district court again, slapped an injunction against the ATF. So GOA members are uh, nationwide are protected in being able to buy and sell firearms privately without the registration aspect. So that's another huge victory. Yeah, because, you know, those uh, registrations, cause obviously registration is anti-constitutional. Yes. So when you go by and do a background check, I heard the ATF still has access to those documents. They do. So... In a way, Almost we're kind of one billion. Yeah. In a way, one, we're registering ourselves. Yes. Yeah. That that okay. that is our end goal. We are working to dismantle all that, and you know, we're taking it piece by piece, laying yeah. uh, the, the groundwork. But that's ultimately where we'd like to end up. That, there's no reason they should have that information. That just turns into well, I mean, we know what what registration yeah. lists historically have been used for. Yep. You know, that's gun confiscation. Mm -hmm. That is true, and. So they have their own loopholes, right? They got the FFLs. They control the FFLs, so they can compel them to do certain things. And next thing you know, our information is in the hands of uh, ATFs. That's, yeah, that's not cool. And you guys are fighting for that. That's, yeah. that's very good. And so we had the pistol brace rule that's completely out now. It's dead in water. Right. Everybody's using them, which is, Fantastic. again, guys, literally Gun Owners of America. And there's some other organizations yes. that did about yep. Gun Owners of America. They went out there and just fought for this. If you guys weren't there and a couple other companies or organizations, honestly, we'd be sitting here still, we couldn't use our pistol races. Now, speaking of that, the ATF, that wasn't a law. ATF actually used a rule. Yes. They had the uh, Congress pass a law a long time ago, allowing the federal agencies to come up with their own interpretation of certain rules, which we all know, God, we're mm. all human. You know, People will use stuff for their own benefits, right? And now I hear that's done for. Yeah, the Chevron. Chevron. Doctrine is what you you're want to talk about, about that? Yeah, uh, that's a, a huge case. I mean, it, it's on its face. I mean, it, it dealt with the fishing industry uh, in, in terms of the specific details, but the ramifications of that victory, because basically what Chevron, Chevron, I think, was a case from the 80s, but the, the long and the short of it is when. Uh, when the government is in court and they are arguing in favor of their rules and regulations, the court is to give deference, as mm -hmm. the name suggests, Chevron deference. They give deference to the agency, basically giving them the benefit of the doubt. Um, that has now been, by, by this court ruling, which came down in June, 
um, that's been eliminated. Uh, that is really important because all those rules and regulations being written by bureaucrats, first of all, you know, constitutionally, where are they getting that authority yeah. from? It's crazy. I mean, Congress is supposed to make yeah. the laws and the president is supposed to sign them into law or veto, but it, they've totally gone around this check and balance. Yeah. So having uh, that ruling was really important uh, for, you know, really uh, yeah. saving our, our liberties. Yeah, so that means going forward, they can't just make it, be making up rules. It's got to go, right? Is that right or no? Well, they'll still be, <laughs> sadly, those mm. agencies are still there. And so they're still going to make rules. However, it means that they are going to be uh, chained closer to law and constitution. That was the problem, is they would get way beyond what the law says, mm. and they would say, well, this is the best interpretation of that law, even though it clearly uh, was many times in defiance of the law. I mean, the bump stock example yeah. is, you know, I mean, a machine gun is, um, uh, you know, a single function of the trigger, and you have multiple rounds coming out. Well, that was clearly not happening with the bump stock. In fact, the ATF did a total 180 on their rulemaking process where they originally said, yeah, it's not a machine gun. Mm -hmm. And then they turned around and said, it is a machine gun. Yeah. And oh, by the way, if you violate that, uh, you can go to jail. Yeah. So uh, that's the type of thing that's going to be prevented where, it, where it's so clearly antithetical to what the law says. Um, they're not going to be able to do that. And now we have a much stronger leg to stand on in court because they can no longer say, oh, well, we're claiming Chevron deference. Okay, I got a, one follow-up on that one, and then I want to move on. So, okay, hypothetically speaking. So you said in the past they could just interpret it. They say this is the closest to this law. That's why we want this rule. Now you're saying that they got to stay closer to the law with the Chevron uh, thing. Who's to say that they're not going to still interpret in a way and say that this yeah. is the best way humans being humans uh they they will still do that however yeah. now they no longer have uh the chevron doctrine to stand on and saying well you know you have to defer to us uh gotcha. now you know they've had that weapon if you will taken Take out of their arsenal so that's that that's why that no you're right i mean tyrants always They're still uh, gonna yeah do it. oh absolutely so yeah. we, you know it's, we haven't worked ourselves out of a job yet. Uh, ultimately, we would love to do that at yeah, GOA, yeah. where we have kicked the anti-gun left into submission so well. Yeah. We've gotten rid of the ATF, and, uh, you know, that there's no more threats, and we can now then, you know, I could go work for, you know, for, yeah, with you on. guys, you know, <laughs> producing something rather than just having to defend it. But, alas, uh, I don't see that happening in the next couple of years. You know, even if it did, I'd love to see... GOA still out there with a shield just just in case someone wants to play again. Yeah, you know, human so nature being that yeah. what it is, we, I think we always will need a defender Absolutely. of our rights. So um, I want to ask you a question. What is a gun-free zone and do they work? Uh, yeah, that's a good laugh line, right? Yeah, yeah. So a gun-free zone is where uh, either by law or by rule or regulation – you are not allowed to bring a firearm into uh, a certain area. Um, and, uh, you know, they vary. It could be restaurants where they serve alcohol, uh, schools. Uh, I think some of the classic ones would be jails and courtrooms. Uh, but uh, what has happened is the anti-gun left has taken what might be a no-brainer, like a jail. I mean, mm -hmm. even prison guards many times won't have arms on mm -hmm. them for obvious reasons. Yep. And they've expanded that. And th although they don't call it a gun-free zone, they call it a sensitive place. Oh, and it's, so it's less And so they've tried to make almost the entire country a sensitive place. That That's what New York did with New York City. They said, well, New York City is a sensitive place. I, you know, so... so this kind of gets back to your earlier question. I mean, you smack, it's like whack-a-mole. You smack yeah. them down over here, and then they think of a way to come up over here and say, yeah. oh, well, it's not a gun-free zone. It's a sensitive place. So, you know, it's different. I, I got to tell you something. So this just makes me laugh. So in Illinois, this just most recently happened. Governor Pritzker, I mean, I guess they put this in front of his desk. I think he was going to sign it. I'm not sure what happened with it. You know, the word offender. 
right? Yes. Did yeah, you I hear know about where that? you're going with it. Yeah. <laughs> so anybody who doesn't know, they changed the word offender because it was too offensive <laughs> <laughs> to justice impacted individual. <laughs> this is a true story. It's like what they did uh, with pedophile. They wait, changed wait. it to maps, minor attracted person. Yeah, we're going through this whole name change. Like, I didn't know that one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know we're getting a little off the beat, know, path, but, but it's, it's, the same, it's the same. It's the same idea. That's what I'm trying to get. At. It's the same idea. Yeah. These people are there running the government, and these are the people that are changing things. Like, this is maybe a pedophilia is maybe something completely different, but still, the idea is the same. That's how they just keep changing. They're getting too sensitive, changing things, and yeah. next thing you know, we don't have a country. Or yeah. We don't have our freedom. And uh, so I'm going to bring us back to our own thing here. And you wrote a book called Firing Back. And I met you um, like a year and a half ago at another event. And you mm -hmm. signed a book and gave it to me. So thanks for that. I read that book three times over. All right. Every time I fly, I always have that book with me. Because you don't just read it one time. Like you just got to, it keeps refreshing my memory. And that is one of those things, folks. You're a Second Amendment supporter, believer in that Constitution, and there's a lot of people who are trying to take that away from us. Yeah. It gives you some ammunition to basically fight back, fire them back, right? Love that book. Read it multiple times over. I'm about to travel overseas in a couple of uh, weeks. I'll have it with me again because I always read it on the plane. Right? Fantastic. 10 hours, 10 hours, great. So I want to play a little game here, and that is I want to play this liberal guy and who's just throwing some questions at you. And I want you to kind of fire back at me. Okay. Is that good? We can do that. All right. So I'm going to go straight to the biggest one, assault rifle. All right. Well, why do we need what, what Tim Walt said, weapon of war? Why do we need AR-15s? Well, first of all, uh, the Second Amendment protects weapons of war. I mean, if you, as an anti-gun liberal, want to say, oh, when it, the Second Amendment was written, all we had was muskets. Well, guess what? Muskets were weapons of war in the 1700s. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea is that we would never be like the Soviet Union or like China, where we would be able to protect ourselves against tyrants. You know, we've never had a Hitler problem for over 200 years in this country because mm -hmm. there are so many guns. So, uh, you know, number one, uh, the Second Amendment, that's actually mm -hmm. what it's intended to protect. Uh, you know, the, the whole term assault weapon, I mean, Let's face it, anything you use to hurt somebody else is an assault weapon, whether mm -hmm. it's a, an, in fact, what's interesting, knives, hammers, even these, fists, mm -hmm. according to the FBI, are used to kill more often than the AR-15. Yep. I mean, AR-15, uh, the New York Times says on an average year, there are 17 murders committed with the AR-15. Uh, there are far more murders committed with fists and feet or with hammers or with knives. So if you really want to be consistent, yeah. then start by banning those items because they kill far more often. Okay. So, all right, AR-15 has high-capacity magazines. It's got 30-round <laughs> magazines, and you're able to shoot them more accurately, and those rounds, you know, blow the lungs out of you. Right. You know right. Say, right? So that's extremely deadly. Like, why do average civilians need those things? Why can't they just do that with a shotgun? Why can't do that with a handgun? Well, I, I don't want an inaccurate weapon. If I'm using it for self-defense, and that's ultimately what the Second Amendment is about. It's about defending ourselves, defending ourselves against uh, tyranny. And to that point, we have fought against tyranny in this country several times. It, it, you know, a lot of people go back to you know, 1776. Well, that was just the beginning. Uh, you look at the civil rights movement. There are many examples of uh, the black community using firearms to protect themselves against the KKK when the police would not protect. In fact, a lot of times uh, the police and the KKK were, yep. you know, uh, buddies, buddies. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Condoleezza Rice, uh, who was um, in the Bush administration, yep. she talks about how her dad would in the 1960s would patrol the neighborhood with their firearms. And many times they had mili uh, former military issue uh, firearms from World War II. Uh, they would patrol the neighborhoods uh, with the other dads. So her dad with other dads, and they were keeping the neighborhood safe. 
Um, that's a, a, a beautiful thing. Of course, there's the famous Battle of Athens uh, in the 1940s. Mm-hmm. Um, and, th- and then, I mean, one of my favorites is in uh, 1906. There was a horrific uh, mob attack against the black community, and uh, they protected themselves with firearms, even to the point when the police showed up. It wasn't to stop the mobsters, uh, they, it wasn't the mob, so to speak, but yeah. the, the the group of people yep. who were mm-hmm. acting as a mob, they showed up to disarm uh, the armed black defenders. And the first cop on the scene got, bl- now this is 1906, yeah. got blown off his saddle and was, was killed. Uh, that stopped the attempt at disarmament. So there have been many, many cases of tyranny. I mean, human nature is what mm-hmm. it is. So that's why we have firearms. And again, that's why we don't have Hitler problems in this country, because uh, the whole idea was that the government should fear the people. Uh, they, they shouldn't fear the people if what they're doing is right. Mm-hmm. But if they're going to act in a tyrannical way, then they should fear the people. James Madison in Federalist Paper 46, and I'm, I may not get it exactly right, but he said what makes us different, the Constitution preserves the right to be armed, where in other countries the governments are afraid to trust the people with arms. Here, their idea was we're going to trust the people with arms. Sadly, in many, especially the blue bastions mm-hmm. in our country, they don't trust the people uh, because they want to tyrannize them. And yeah. so they don't want people having arms. And they claim it's all about safety. But you talked about Chicago. How has that brought, banning guns has not brought safety? Yep. Uh, you know, making it harder for people to own or carry firearms has not brought safety in Chicago. OK, speaking of that, playing, continuing to play the game and we're going to go to gun laws now. All right. So. If you ban guns, there'll be less guns on the streets. Why, why not ban guns? There will be less guns on the street, perhaps, amongst the law-abiding, because law-abiding like to be law-abiding. But how well did banning alcohol stop the criminal element from getting alcohol? Or how uh, effective was the drug war against stopping drugs? I, the idea that we are going to ban an object and keep it from being available is ludicrous. All, all you do when you do that is you make sure the bad guys have it. And that's exactly what happens in mm-hmm. Chicago. And what's interesting is then when it doesn't work, they say, oh, that's because the bad guys are getting it from Indiana or neighboring states. Okay, maybe they are getting it from there. Why doesn't Indiana or the neighboring states have the same crime problem as Chicago? Why are the guns only a problem when they get into Chicago? Oh, maybe it's because, A, they're not, you know, they're throwing the criminals back out on the street. Uh, Maybe it's because they do make it difficult for Mm -hmm. carry and, you know, all these gun-free zones and things like that, which, you know, if you make one gun-free zone, you, if somebody's going to be completely law-abiding, let's say they want to go to a game and they know that they're at Wrigley Field, they can't take their gun, that means that whole trip to Wrigley Field and all the way Mm -hmm. back, it's a gun-free zone for them. That's the problem with gun-free zones. It's not just saying, oh, it's just in that one area yeah. that you can't have a gun. No, it's the whole the trip whole there and back. Yeah. Exactly. And Chicago, as a person who's from Chicago, as a person who was in law enforcement, not CPD, Illinois State Police, who was there, I've, and I was a crime scene investigator in the northern region of uh, Illinois, which covered Chicago, it was by far the most violent area I've ever mm. seen in my life. I was at that morgue, Cook County morgue, every single morning, almost, right? And there were just bodies mm. stacked up on top of each other. All of them were shot. Young, generally males, right? So, and they were all happening in Chicago, okay? And, and as a person who was in law enforcement, a lot of times we'd have these guns, the little guns, I don't know where they got it from, from over the border or something, no serial numbers and nothing, right? The stolen guns or they just make their own things. Like, it was... You're never going to stop, stop it. I, I saw a Nat Geo e- yeah. episode. I mean, California has some of the strictest gun control laws. Nat Geo was showing how they're making illegal guns in the Philippines and they boat them in but, to California. Yeah. And so there's all these guns. You know, they were like, oh, how this is terrible. All these yeah. unregistered, uh, no serial number guns on the street. You're never going to stop it. You are so never going to stop banning it. Banning guns, in a way, when you ban guns, 
you're going to empower. So basically, you're yes. going to empower criminals. Yes. It's going to be a business. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they're not just... Just like it was in Prohibition. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And then you're going to put more guns on the streets on the illegal side, let's just say, and you're going to be basically punishing the law-abiding yep. folks. That's literally what's going to happen. We're going to, you're going to victimize us uh, further into gun crime. Right. That's literally what's going to happen. All right. So people, again, on the left, argue that, hey, you know, if you do ban guns... Yes, law-abiding citizens will not have guns. Therefore, they won't have guns to lose or get stolen to the bad guys. So, therefore, bad guys are going to have less guns. Except, yeah, that doesn't work. Just as as we were talking about, I mean, they they make them in other countries and smuggle them in. I mean, they make guns in prisons. Right, I agree. Right? I mean, look at the Japan, the the Japanese. Yes, the prime minister. minister, A homemade gun was used to to kill that guy. So you will. The technology is there. You will not stop it. Uh, Criminals will get in, and that's you know that's kind of like the best case scenario. I mean, let's face it. There are millions of guns. Like removing piss from a pool water. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Literally, that's it's just not going to happen. And yeah. let's face it, many of us uh, are just going to have some uh, boating accidents. So you're not getting our guns. Okay. <laughs> I agree with you. And guess what? Guns are the problem for these some of the mass shooting, they say. Which mass shooting is another topic to, for discussion. A lot of everything yeah. is titled as mass shooting. But guns are the problem, uh, not those folks. That's yeah. what they're saying. What do you that think that is that? what they say. Um, gun-free zones are the problem. 94%. Since 1950, John Lott, a criminologist, has tracked this. Since 1950, 94% of the mass shootings in this country have occurred in gun-free zones. And it makes total sense. If you're a bad guy, mm-hmm. you, you read their manifestos. Many of them talk about this, that they've yeah. chosen an area where either their victims are going to be disarmed or where the laws of the state have made it difficult for people to carry. Uh, like the, the Buffalo killer talked about this. Yeah. He chose an area where he knew that there would be fewer concealed carry people shooting back at them. That makes sense. Mm. That's why they don't go shoot up a police station. You know criminals don't like cops. Why don't they choose That's police right. stations? Because they have guns there. Why don't they go to gun shows and shoot it up? One of the worst places to go would be the Knoxville Convention Center during our convention. That's right. Because uh, concealed carry is allowed. Yeah. Uh, this is going to be one of the safest places in yeah. the country uh, for two days. Isn't that funny how you said that? Like, look at the gun industry as a whole. Like, we're one big family over here. Do we really, ha- really have this gun violence problem in this industry? No, we, we don't have it. We're all, I mean, I have so many guns myself. I've had guns for 13 years. Mine never really did anything. I bet yours are like mine. They're really lazy. They just, just lay around yeah. the, the, the safe and, you know, they never break out or yeah. do any, you know. So it must be not <laughs> guns, obviously. It's just us. You know, that's what we did. People don't understand these things. All right. Last uh, question on this little game, magazine capacity. Why do you need 30 rounds? Why do you need 21 round mag- magazines? Well, a, because I can. Uh, I know a lefty won't like to hear that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the Second Amendment says shall not be infringed. But practically speaking, and that's probably what the leftist wants to hear, there are times when you're facing uh, gang violence. I mean, I can give you examples of people who've had have been uh, assaulted by m- multiple people in a gang, and they shot back. And I can think of one case in Florida not too long ago. He fired over 30 rounds shooting at seven people who were breaking into his home. Um, You know, you want that kind of firepower to be Mm -hmm. able to defend yourself uh, if you are under tremendous attack. That's number one. Number two, going back to what we were talking about earlier, if ultimately the Second Amendment is about defense against tyranny, then only a tyrant would want to reduce our magazine capacity. You know, that's a very good point. And my argument has always been about the whole assault rifle AR-15, right? As a person who was in the law enforcement and this stuff, and, and I do have multiple uh, AR-15s right now, and I'm a believer in the Second Amendment, uh, my argument is this. Number one, as you said, because we can. That's our right. You don't get to tell us no. And when it comes to common use, it's been already, already proven many times. Yeah. AR-15 is pretty much the mo- one of the most common use a rifle in the United States. But my thing is this. If I need to explain myself, besides the Constitution, <laughs> and it is literally this. AR-15, you know, they say that it's a devastating round. Good, because if I am actually applying 
lethal force against someone who is trying to kill me or those around me, I would like that threat to stop as fast as possible. Right. Number two, I'm responsible for every round that I fire. Right. I am more accurate with an AR-15 than I am with a handgun. So if I have a threat in front of me, and that threat is posing this life-threatening uh, threat against me or my family or those loved ones around me, or people around me, I need that threat stopped as fast as possible. Literally, as fast as possible. That's what they teach us in law enforcement. That's how we tra yes. train. Well, AR-15 will do that extremely fast for me. The lefties always want to say, why don't you just shoot them in the leg? Yeah, go ahead. Good luck. <laughs> how, about, how about you do that? You know what? You want to gamble with your life? It's up to you. You know what? Everybody has their own thresholds. If you want to gamble with your life and try to shoot someone in a more like non-fatal area, it could be fatal, but it's not going to be an immediate incapacitation right. for the most part. Right. And who's trying to kill you? It's up to you. What I believe in, if you are trying to hurt me, I need to overpower you somehow to... Like, I need to apply more force against you to overpower you. Right. And if you are trying to kill me, why would I apply less uh, force against you? Right. That's it. So for me, an AR-15 debate is, number one, there's a lot of folks out there with bad guys with AR-15s or AKs or whatever, some rifles that are coming at me. Number two, I need to stop the threat as fast as possible. Yeah. Shooting someone with a pistol caliber or rifle caliber, it doesn't matter. I'm still shooting that person. Yeah. One of them stops the other the person a lot faster than the other. So that's my take on it. And last question. If this Second Amendment shall not be infringed, and it's a written constitution, we got laws on it, how is it possible that states or legislators, they are able to infringe? They're able to change this? I'm, I'm really baffled by this. How is it possible? How well, it, it shouldn't be possible. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, that's... But isn't that the, the heart of a tyrant is to uh, ignore the law, ignore the Constitution? I think a lot of these people who take an oath to uphold the Constitution have never even read the Constitution. Uh, you know, and as good as some of the Supreme Court decisions have been uh, recently, and, and we're thankful for them, ultimately, they're not as good as if Eric Pratt, Justice Eric Pratt, were writing it because... I would focus on shall not be infringed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean that. You know, g doing the whole text, history, and tradition. I mean that that's all very helpful, and that's preventing a lot of gun control. Uh, but ultimately, there's a much easier test, and it's the one in the Second Amendment. Is it an infringement or not? Yeah. I mean, bottom line, boom. Uh, that's what I always thought. Like the, the, we're talking about the California, right? Like what's happening in Illinois right now, and other uh, blue states are just following through. I'm like baffled. I'm like, oh, yeah, Constitution says this. Yeah. And they are just going out there and just banning things. Yeah. No rifles and no pistol grip shotguns or no ma like magazine capacity issues. Or if you have a rifle, you get to screw over here and put this. Yep. What, how? Like, uh, that's, I'm baffled by that. But that's why you guys are here. That Gun is why we're here. Yeah. Yeah, we got a great team of lawyers, yeah. uh, a great team of lobbyists. Uh, we actually got a, a law uh, repealed uh, in it in terms of its enforcement this past year, the Veterans Gun Ban. Mm -hmm. uh, so th that's why we're here is to repeal gun control. So yeah. uh, we're excited about that. I'm really excited about all of this. And y lastly, what else is out there? Who's going to be on the panel? So that way, when this thing's out there, we could actually look for those things. Absolutely. A yeah. lot of good speakers and panelists. Yeah. The mayor of Knoxville uh, is going to be there. Glenn yeah. Jacobs, uh, wrestling fans will know him as Kane. Okay. Um, uh, a couple Newsmax um, anchors, Carl Higby, uh, Chris Salcedo, uh, Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson, who's running for governor. Uh, Jared of Guns and Gadgets. Yeah. Uh, Brandon Langley, Brandon yeah. Herrera. Yeah. Uh, Braden Langley, sorry. Yeah, Brandon, uh, Brandon yeah. Herrera. Uh, John Lovell of Warrior Poets Society. Um, I'll be one of the speakers. I, they let uh, anybody speak, I guess. <laughs> uh, it, yeah. It's, it's a, a good lineup. We're really excited about it. Yeah. No, thanks. thanks a lot for uh, putting this event together. I'm assuming there's going to be more of this coming uh, up in the future. That's the plan. Right? This yep. is the first one. This, this is this the is, inaugural event. Yeah, it is. Good, good stuff. I look forward to it. Ladies and gentlemen, check out, obviously, Eric Pratt, Senior Vice President of Gun Owners of America. Also, check out Gun Owners of America. They really do need your membership, your support, so they can continue fighting for our rights. Again, if you can use pistol braces right now, organizations like GOA, 
and the, the FRT triggers and other stuff. Like you can carry into New York now with your permit all of these things that you may not see in the background. These guys are fighting for you. So get out there and be a member and have the perks. <laughs> like, hey, if I could have it, like I could, I was a member. A lot of folks couldn't have a pistol brace when that nationwide injunction happened. But if you were a GA member, you could have. So there's that. Sir, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, you very yeah. much.